Welcome to episode two of Unbreakable. Where are we? Why are we here? Let's start at the beginning. Hello and welcome to Crossroads, which comes to you today from one of the harshest and most unforgiving environment on all of planet Earth, the desert. Blazing sun and scorching heat by day, bitter cold and frigid temperatures at night, biting wind pretty much all the time. So why am I here? What's in this box? But well, we're here in the desert because I know you are in the desert. The good news, you don't have to stay here. In fact, at Crossroads, we exist to guide you out of the personal desert you find yourself in to the adventurous life that God has made you for. Each week, our teachers right. will deliver a powerful message using the book of Exodus. They were in a desert. Or in a desert. Wandering in the desert. Now. Follow the map I've given them and complete surprise challenges along the way. So we're not just preaching, we're actually doing things. So what's this? Today, will Allie conquer her fear? Will Chuck give us the courage to move? Will Brian stop trying to touch people with animals? Let's get started with episode two of Unbreakable. Today, we're gonna start with the truth that you need to hear. God is unbreakable. And that's good news because life tries to break us all the time but an unbreakable God can give you the courage to break through what holds you back. I don't know what's holding you back. I don't know where you feel stuck. Maybe it's indecision. Maybe you know where to go, but it's just hard to figure out the first step. Maybe it is fear. Maybe it is uncertainty. Maybe you don't feel qualified for the thing that you're wired and called to do, but I want you to know this. Today, today, if you'll hang in there with me, you're going to get the courage to move. God wants to give you the courage to move. All right, Chuck, time to open it up. All right, man, you sure? There's no snakes in here, There's right? There's no snakes, no, 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 you're oh, fine. Just, just, just okay. trust me, just open it up. I've been freaking out about snakes since I heard about this. Okay, so here we go, let's open and see what's in here. Oh, no, no snakes, it's actually, it's a letter. It's a letter. Um, actually, it says, this is a story from someone watching right now. They're in a desert in their life and your job is to teach your message to them. Huh, okay, and help them get out of the desert. So I've got a letter from a guy named Nick. He says, over the last year, I've faced terrible mental health problems. I spent the better part of 2020 in bed or in the hospital, all while working a demanding sales job and raising three young children. It's crazy. To most, I'm a normal person, but inside I feel like I can't breathe multiple times a day. How will it ever be okay? Hey, Nick, I, I'm glad you're watching. And I wanna encourage you. I don't know exactly what you're going through. I wouldn't presume to know what it's like to live what you've lived over the last year, but I will tell you this. I believe today you're gonna to find the courage to move. I hope that from this message, you or Nick, if, you're, if there are people that can relate to Nick's story, that you're gonna be encouraged to move. You know, I'm on a journey in my life and I know what it's like to wake up with an uncertainty. I know what it's like to wake up fearful, uncertain, wondering do I have what it takes to move forward. And I can't think of any story in the Bible that's better for if that's where you find yourself than the story of Exodus. We've talked about this in this series that the book of Exodus is a foundational story in the Bible. It's a foundational story because we see in the sweeping story of Exodus everything that plays out in the entire story of the Bible and the story of how God is engaging in your life and my life today. There's this, this struggle from slavery to freedom. There's this longing for a rescuer, a deliverer, right? And beautifully, it ends with the finding of a promised land. There is something that happens at the end of this journey that encourages you. So listen, the next few minutes, if you'll hang in there with me for the next few minutes, you're going to find the courage to move. There are amazing stories in Exodus. It's crazy. There's a death-dealing angel. There's a miracle-working staff, the sea that becomes a highway. But if you're going to find the courage, and if this story is going to connect with you, then you got to know what got you stuck. you got to know what's in the way. And I just want to tell you, we see this all throughout the Bible. There are three things that keep all of us stuck. Shame, guilt, and fear. In fact, let me ask you a question. Think about where you feel stuck right now. Nick, I want you to think about this. And I bet you it boils down to one of these three things, shame, fear, or guilt. You know why? It's because you have an enemy. You have an enemy that wants to keep you stuck. We're gonna see today that the nation of Israel had an enemy. There were people who were trying to keep them from moving forward. But here's the thing. If you feel stuck by shame, fear, or guilt, if you're stuck believing your life doesn't matter, if you're stuck not knowing if you have what it takes, I wanna encourage you today. God says to you, it's time to move. Chuck has to be one of the most empathetic people on the planet. 
right off the bat, he's in our corner and encouraging Nick, and there's way more to come. For now, let's hop over to Allie and Brian as they discover their challenge for the week. I've put a surprise in the box that I know will get a reaction and also may get me kicked off at least one of their Christmas card lists. Well, I hope Chuck is doing well. Yeah, look, I think this is what we were looking for. Finally, the sun is killing me. Talk about crispy. I know. All right, let's see what we got here. I'll trust you again. All right. All right, I'm here ready. we go. I got some practice. You did a good job last time. Oh, that was close. Good thing there's a target guard there. I'm excited. <laughs> That's all right. excited. All right, what all do right. we have here? Oh. <laughs> no, thanks. Uh, yeah. All right. Yes. Here's our card. Yes, what does it say? In the book of Exodus, the nation of Israel was set free from captivity in Egypt. God used a series of plagues on the Egyptians to get Pharaoh to let my people go in order to get out of the desert and get to the next set of food rations, you too will need to survive the plagues. I think I see where this is going. I think I do. So how if I lift this up and then get that okay. board and get it set back up on there. So what we have here looks like Whoa. is a box of plagues. All right, so. We have frogs there. Is that frog turds? You see? You see, you see the frog turds in there? The challenge here is to move each and every frogs, both of you, from this case into the wooden case. He Once you've done that, off. you can enjoy your daily food ration and dessert. Very generous of us. Well, let Go me ahead. Right. Let me just... I'm not. I don't... This is. This is very. No, oh, no, they're moving. <laughs> they are moving. Frogs okay. do that. I know. <laughs> what do we have in here? No. We've got some Neapolitan ice cream, because of course God provides ice cream. What is what is this? You, it has small lettering. You can read that better than I can. What is that? Food ration. One day's norm of food. Well, so it's probably like... Um, this is our survival kit. Probably like manna fell, fell down from heaven. We're being provided for. for a day. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, yeah. Praise be. <laughs> All right. You want me to go first? Yeah. Well, let me All show right. you. Oh, putting him oh, in this thing. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> you dropped it. You heard him. Oh. He's all right. Him. Look, watch. Look at that. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> gonna put it on Just you! Just put the frog down! <laughs> gonna put Just it put the frog what? down! This could be your prince! Just you have, why don't you kiss this? Because you have no idea what happened if you... Put the frog down! Alright, I'll put it there. Okay. You should, Go ahead, you, you do one. Known better. You do one. Kyle. You guys can wipe this off. Right, just <laughs> stop. Alright, get out of my way. Alright, go ahead. I'm doing it. Alright. I don't like this. Push yourself, Allie. But I will do it. It's not slimy, it's not, it, it's just, don't even think about it, just put your hand on it and scoop it up. They're, they're, they're actually very mellow. You are strong, you are courageous, you do not have fear of things like these. I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious here. Okay, this is why I, I love I being part of Brian's team. He's one of the strongest right, encouragers I, I know. Watch his words to Allie give her the courage to move. You want me? There you go. You got him. 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 Awesome. I can feel his little That's bones. <laughs> Anytime we choose to act and move despite fear, it's a big moment. Well done, Allie. Shoot. Sorry, buddy. As Brian and Allie work on the rest of their challenge, let's head there back to Good. Chuck, who doesn't know that in a few minutes, I'm going to throw a curveball question at him that I'm certain you'd ask if you could. So let's start with a little bit of background on the Exodus story. The Exodus story starts with the nation of Israel in Egypt where they have been for 400 years in slavery. It's harsh work, it's a horrible life. And God uses Moses and calls him to be the one that rescues them from slavery. So after 400 years, you imagine that? After 400 years, God finally is going to fulfill this promise that he's made to set his people free. This is what he says in Exodus 6.1. He says, now you shall see what I will do with Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the king of Egypt. He was the one that was keeping them enslaved. And he says with this, for with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. You know what God is saying? God is saying, in the place where you felt stuck, 
it's time to move. God is giving them a vision of a life that doesn't look like slavery anymore. It's a life of freedom. And the stagnation is over. But you know what? Like I said, there are three things, three roadblocks that Israel's going to face, that you and I face when it comes to going forward in courage. Shame, guilt, and fear. Let's talk about shame. Shame is what we see Moses, the leader, the one that God has called, struggling with big time. See, Moses struggles with shame because he had a speech impediment. We don't know what it is. We just know that Moses said himself, I'm not great with words, I'm slow of speech. And so right away we see him being hit with shame. You know, he goes to Pharaoh, the king. He says, God gave me a message. The message is you have to let my people go. And Pharaoh just is like, whatever, whatever. I don't know who you are. And I certainly don't know who your God is. I'm not changing anything. And Moses just feels so defeated in the moment. And Moses is stuck in shame. And he begins to say these things over himself that are just so self-limiting and self-defeating. You know, this is the way shame works. If you struggle with shame, you got to be careful about the words you say about yourself. We see Moses repeating these shame statements over and over again in the story. In Exodus 6, 12, it says, Behold, this is Moses talking. Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. See, Moses had rehearsed his shame. And what happens when you rehearse shame is it becomes your identity. And it robs you of the courage to move. But look at what God does. If you're stuck in shame, God will come right at your wounded identity. And in that very place, he will speak a redeemed identity. So in Exodus 4, look at what God says to Moses. Very specific. He says, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go and listen to these very specific words. He says to Moses, I will be with your mouth. He doesn't just say generally, I will be with you. He says, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Shame won't get the final word. That's what God is saying to Moses. God says, I get the final word. And he goes directly to the point of his shame and says, I will be with your mouth. I can relate to this because in my life, I have struggled with shame. I've struggled with the shame that comes from a life of addiction after addiction, specifically a pornography addiction. It almost tanked my marriage before it ever began. And so for me to think about being a person who could be in front of a screen, talking to you about following God, I just saw myself as damaged goods. I didn't think this is something I could do. And I would say over myself, I will never get over this. I will always struggle with this. I was stuck in those same shaming statements so I can relate to how Moses was feeling. And you know what God said? over my shame. God said the very place where you feel wounded and you feel like damaged goods, I call you a wounded healer. God literally has called me to be very open about my struggle so that other people who have the same struggle or a different struggle or a similar struggle can see that there's a guy, there's a guy who's not perfect. There's a guy who hasn't had it all figured out, but God can be with you at the point of your shame. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I just want you to know if you feel like you've gotten a death sentence because of shameful things in your life, you don't. You don't. I'm a living example of how an unbreakable God can help you break through shame and move forward with courage and with purpose in your life. So in the story of the nation of Israel, as Moses struggles with his shame, he continues to go to Pharaoh. He continues to speak. He continues to use his mouth and God is with him. But Pharaoh's still not budging. Pharaoh's still not having it. Pharaoh's like, nope, not letting them go. Not going to do it. And then God starts to do these incredible miracles to get Pharaoh's attention. Make no mistake about it. These are crazy, crazy things. The water turns to blood in Egypt. So they lose their water supply. And then frogs come and dominate the land. Then there's gnats. And then there's flies. And then livestock starts dying in mass. Later on, boils come and affect everybody's skin. Later on, it's hail. And then locusts come and eat up all the crop. And finally, darkness falls over the entire land. Now you would think, you would think after these nine things, Pharaoh would start to wake up, right? He'd start to say, all right, maybe I need to change my mind. But he is so hard-hearted. He is so hard-hearted that he actually says, even with all of the things that are happening, I'm not changing a thing. And then there's a 10th plague. And see, this 10th plague is the one that will cause Pharaoh to relent. I don't know about you, but I think it would have caused me to relent as well. And it's through this plague that we actually see how God deals with guilt. 
See, because what happens next is a powerful picture that, again, we see played out not just in the story of Egypt, not, story, not just in the story of Exodus, but throughout the entire Bible of how a perfect God deals with the guilt of imperfect people like you and like me. In Exodus 4.21, God says this to Moses. He says, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles I have placed in your power but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. God warned Moses that, hey, this guy is not just gonna up and say, great, I'm ready, let him go. And he says though, then you will say this to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. This is really important that we see, that the relationship that God has to these people of Israel is not just this random amalgamation of people that God generally cares about because God generally loves all people. No, you know what? God says this nation is like my firstborn child. I'm a father of three. I love all of my kids, but I can tell you something, man, when you have your firstborn, it is a special, powerful moment. And God says, that's the kind of relationship I have to the nation of Israel. And he says to Pharaoh, so let my son go. Let my son go so he may serve me. And if you refuse, God makes this crazy, really direct, clear warning to Pharaoh, I will kill your firstborn son. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Okay, weird enough, the river turns to blood, the gnats, the frogs, weird. all that stuff. We're supposed to believe that God said he would kill the firstborn of everybody in Egypt? I thought he was the loving God. You gotta help me understand this, Chuck. What's yeah, happening? You, you know, I, man, I, I get it. And, and here's the thing, God is loving, he's also just, right? And so God is working okay. a bigger story of justice for people who have been enslaved. And he says to this leader, Pharaoh, who has the chance to actually bring freedom to these people or to let them experience freedom, these are high stakes. It's a very clear warning. And God is saying to Pharaoh, if you continue to turn your heart away from me, there will be consequences. Okay, good, thank you, keep going. All right, keep going. All right, I've already said a mouthful and we're talking about some really weighty things. Talking about shame, that's a weighty thing. And now I just wanna unpack what I mean when I talk about guilt. You know, feeling guilt is actually a normal human response, and it's a good thing that we have it. Otherwise, there would be things that we would do without any remorse around. However, here's what the problem is. Feeling it is one thing. Wallowing in it, that's not a great place to be. And you know what's maybe even worse? Thinking we can work it off if we just do enough good things, if we just balance the scales. I know this because, again, this is something that I have wrestled with. So people pleasing is a way that guilt has shown up in my life. Well, let me put it this way. Because I'm guilty, I try to please people. See, here's what I think. It's broken thinking, it's stinking thinking, if you wanna call it that, but it's absolutely been my thinking. I thought that the way that I can make up for all of the ways that I am doing these shameful things in private was to try to be like the perfect model citizen in public somehow believing that if I could just please enough people, if I was seen as the good person, it, it kind of you know, balanced the scales behind all the private broken things that I was doing in my life. But here's the thing, that never works. Cause you know who you can never fool? Yourself. You can never fool yourself. So then what is the alternative? We feel guilty. How does that guilt not keep us from being stuck? And this is what now happens in the story. God gives Moses this commandment. And this thing happens in the story that is all about how a perfect God deals with the guilt that you and I feel. In Exodus 12, 21, it says this, then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and select lambs for yourselves and kill the Passover lamb. This is gonna be the ceremonial thing that happens today in the story, but will continue to happen year after year in the life of the nation of Israel. Take a bunch of hyssop, which is like something that would be adhesive, and dip it in the blood from the slain lamb that is in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts. And then he says this, none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. He's saying, look, you have to stay in the place that is protected by the blood. And the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your house and strike you. God is about to do this 10th plague, and it is something that we just can't even fathom. There is an angel called the destroyer and God is going to release it. And he's gonna release it to kill the firstborn, not just human, but even livestock in every home that isn't protected by the blood. What is it about this blood? What, what is that about? Well, here's the thing. God is illustrating that he and only he can, can make a way to cover the guilt, to cover the guilt 
that we feel when we fall short, to cover the guilt that we feel when we do what the Bible calls sin. And God makes a commitment that if you have been faithful and you have followed through on what he has asked you to do with this blood, he is not going to count the guilt in that home against that family. Why? Well, it's just simply a sign that God chooses to illustrate because these folks who do this are demonstrating that it's an act of faith and trust in him. See, this story is the first Passover. And Passover is celebrated every year by Jews all around the world. In fact, what we know is that Jesus would have celebrated the Passover every year of his life. And particularly, he celebrated the last year of his life. So think about it. This story of Exodus was so powerful that every year, and still every year all across the world, Jews remember the story. They remember the story of being slaves. Slaves, not just in Egypt, but slaves to sin. Slaves to brokenness, slaves to shame and guilt. And they remember the delivery that God brought through Moses, through the rescuer. And part of that meal is they eat a lamb. They eat a lamb that reminds them of how God made a way through the blood of the lamb. See, here's the thing. If you struggle with guilt, if you're wallowing in it, or if you're thinking you need to work it off, you need to know that an unbreakable God gives you the courage to break through the guilt that holds you back. Did you know that Jesus was actually killed? He was crucified during the Passover. 2,000 years later, in fact, the Last Supper, the time when Jesus sat with his disciples and said, I'm gonna break my body for you. I'm gonna spill my blood for you. He was actually having a Passover meal with his disciples. And the very next day, he became the final Passover lamb. God sent Jesus to be the final Passover lamb. He sent Jesus to be the final blood that would cover over our guilt. This is how our guilt gets resolved. It doesn't get resolved by working it off. It doesn't get resolved by wallowing in it. It gets resolved when we trust in the final and finished work of Jesus. In the New Testament, in the book of Romans, it says this in Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned, meaning everybody's guilty, and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a, listen to this, propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. I love Romans 8, 1, which says it this way. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you've been stuck in shame, it's time to move forward in courage. If you've been stuck in guilt, it's time to move forward in courage. Nick, I, I'm thinking about you right now because I would imagine that as you've just wrestled with the challenges that you've had physically and you talked about your mental challenges, that there's a sense in guilt. There's probably a sense of guilt as a father that you haven't been able to be the dad that you wanted to be for your three kids that you haven't been able to be the, 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 um, the worker that you wanna be and all the other things that make up your life. And, and Nick, if I could tell you anything that would help encourage you in this moment, I would just let you know, God's not expecting you to do it all. God is not expecting you to be able to solve this for yourself. That in the same way that Jesus' finished work on the cross is what made it possible for you to be free from the guilt of sin, trust in Jesus, Nick. He doesn't want you to trust in yourself. He doesn't even want you to trust in medical doctors. I'm all for that. And I hope that you're finding help in all those places. But just know that as you go through this journey, you can move forward in courage because you can trust in Jesus. He will be there for you. After the powerful experience of the first Passover, Pharaoh relents and God fulfills his promise. Amazing. End of story, and the Israelites live happily ever after, right? Well, is that how it ends in your stories? Of course not. Of course not. We talked about shame and how God can give you the power to break shame. We talked about guilt and how through the work of Jesus, he, he solves for guilt. But what about fear? What about fear? Now, here's the thing. The Israelites go from 430 years of slavery to an immediate exit. Exodus 12, 33 and 39 says the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, wouldn't you? After having experienced the death angel coming through, the death of firstborn. For they said, we shall all be dead. And they baked unleavened cakes, which is cakes that they don't allow to rise with yeast, of the dough they had brought out of Egypt, for it was leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Do you remember what God said to Moses? Remember he said with a strong hand, Pharaoh would thrust them out. This is what God was prophesying. It actually happens. 
It's crazy. It's beautiful. Are the Israelites happy? You better believe they're happy. But are they also scared? They sure are. Can you imagine, just think about the last time, if you've ever moved, all the logistics that went into a move for a family of, I don't know, one, two, five, however many you have in your family, 10. But a million people leaving overnight, having had no memory of any life other than slavery. Can you imagine the anticipation? Can you imagine the nervousness that the Israelites might have been feeling? You know what? We have to be really mindful that we can get comfortable in a living hell. Seriously, we can get comfortable with circumstances and situations that are not what God has for us. And there's so much more, so we have to be careful not to settle. They had to move, and you know what? They had to do it scared. They had to do it scared. You ever had done that? You ever had to take a move? You ever had to make a decision in your life? But you had to do it scared, without a plan, without preparations, without a safety net? That's where the Israelites find themselves. They go. And God, because he's such a kind, kind shepherd, knows that the nation of Israel is fragile. Their courage is fragile. And so in Exodus 13, it says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, that was the direct route. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. See, God is such a good shepherd. He calls Israel his firstborn son, and he knew that their courage was frail. Their faith was frail. They were taking the first steps of a journey, and maybe that's how you feel. You're taking the first steps of a journey, and God knew if a first couple steps in, they had to face war with another country just coming out of slavery, that might have broke them. And so God in his graciousness sends them another way. And he does this. In Exodus 13, 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, to lead them along the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and night. God gives them a physical, a literal, tangible sense of his presence in this cloud by day and this fire by night. Now you might say, boy, my life would be a lot easier if God did that for me, if God gave me a physical, tangible way to experience him. Well, guess what? He has. It's called the church. And I don't mean the building, the church. I mean the people, the church. That's why we need community because when we have people around us who are encouraging us to make moves, we are experiencing the physical, literal body of Christ encouraging us. But even though the Red Sea was an easier path, it was about to get a lot more difficult for the Israelites, a lot more difficult. See, Pharaoh changed his mind. After saying, okay, they can go, once they're in the desert, Pharaoh changes his mind. And what does Pharaoh do? Pharaoh musters up all of his army. He gets all of his chariots, and he is on a war path to destroy the nation of Israel, at minimum, to bring them back into slavery after they had just been set free. And here's the thing. God had taken them to the sea, and so they find themselves in this situation where they're trapped. In front of them is an impassable sea, and behind them, giving chase, is Pharaoh and his army, and they become afraid. Wouldn't you be afraid? You ever felt trapped? You ever felt like, man, I took a couple steps, and now I'm in no man's land, and God, I don't know what's coming next. The people were in a panic, but listen to what Moses says to them. He says, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. The Lord will fight for you and you only have to be silent. See, I want you to see that in this story of God parting the Red Sea, there are two miracles here. There are two miracles. Yes, he parts the Red Sea. There's a song we sing. It says, you turn seas into highways. Like, man, he did that. He literally took a sea and split it in half so they could walk through on dry land. But here's the thing. He makes a way where there is no way, but God also does something incredible. Incredible. This angel of the Lord the Bible says, had been traveling with the nation of Israel. And then we know that God was also with them through this pillar of fire or this pillar of cloud. Look at what happens as Israel, I mean, as Egypt and their armies are closing in from the back and God separates the sea, making a way where there is no way. It says this in Exodus 14, then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. 
the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. And it says throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the Egyptian army. They couldn't see, but it brought light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Here's the thing. You may have heard this story before, and we can focus on the fact that God parted the Red Sea. And we should, because that's amazing. But don't miss the fact that God literally gets behind them. God has their back. See, if you feel stuck, if you feel like you can't move, I want you to know God literally has your back. If you're willing to do it scared, God has your back. If you're willing to take a step, even in faith, God has your back. If you're willing to walk forward, God has your back. He makes a way where there is no way going forward. And he's got your back as you take that step. See, I asked you a question at the beginning and I want you to consider it now. Where is God calling you to move? What is holding you back? Is it shame? Is it guilt? Is it fear? An unbreakable God can give you the courage to move forward against whatever holds you back. God speaks a different word in your very place of shame. He removes your guilt with the blood of his son, Jesus, and he literally has your back as you move. So if you've been stuck in shame, it's time to move. If you feel stuck in guilt right now, it's time to move. If you have been stuck in fear, God's got your back. You can move. An unbreakable God is fighting for you. you Wanna do this guy? He's pretty easy. No, you I'll take him. Right, I'm gonna I'll go here. Him. Survey my options. Yeah, while well, you survey your options. <laughs> I'm gonna do another one. We all have to do things we don't like. Got him, got him. Good job. I'm gonna do a twofer. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go again, okay. it's fine. A good, gets easier every time, doesn't it? Well, pretty yucky, I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna go you, there I you don't go. like this. There you go, good. Okay. So I got one more, there you go. You don't wanna do something, that's the time to move on it. And yep. you just did it, we just did it. That's pretty great, seriously, that's pretty great. I don't wanna be someone who just goes, I mean, I, believe me, I'm all ooh about this. I don't wanna have anything to do with it, but also, it's fine. Yeah. Like, I just, I'm gonna be a person that does things I don't wanna do, because sometimes that's the deal. And sometimes you just gotta power through it. Well, I mean, goodness, I don't think you can read the Bible and come up with the idea that God is somehow interested in keeping us comfortable. So, that's clearly not the case. But he is up for- <laughs> Ice cream? Giving us Neapolitan ice cream. There's frog poop on, the, on the- I would start with dessert. I think you deserve that. I can't imagine this is remotely good. It looks awful. It looks like the desert. That's not oh, how people that, eat No, that's weird. Bar. That's not. Oh. Mine's pink. You got chocolate? Is it tasty? Oh. I don't know. Let's find out. No, it's not tasty. This is like a bar of soap. It's, it's not, not worth whatever calories like are in a... there. Full. <laughs> Utterly awful. You yeah, know what? Chuck. I'm going to take this to Chuck. The uh, idea here hey, is how's it going? Chuck. Hey, huh. my NGO. What is that? <laughs> just in time. Oh, that just for you. Look at that. That was just like like. Desert ice cream. Uh, it's supposed to be that, yes. Okay. And this is a whole day for you. Could you could live on this for a whole day? Oh, supposedly. Okay. All right, all right. Do you want a bite of ice cream? Oh, you got one. I have one. Yes. Yeah. What? Not how people good ice eat cream. ice cream. <laughs> Look, these guys. This is what we had to do. Oh, we, we had to take them from here. Okay. And transfer them into that other container. Mm. I struggled a little bit, I'm not gonna lie. Did you do it? I did not want to touch move? them. I moved. I love it, I, I love moved it. Not just one, Allie not didn't stay two, stuck. She did, not she three. absolutely did. How, how do you know you're not tasting frogs on your ice cream? Maybe you don't even know what the ice cream tastes like. That's gross. Maybe, maybe that, that, maybe that, that is. Don't <laughs> That was frog juice you're eating right there. I feel like today was mission accomplished. The challenge was tell the people, give them the courage to move, help us get out of the desert, become unbreakable. I feel like that happened today. I hope you enjoyed our experience. We sure did, at least parts of it. Maybe not the ice cream or the frogs so much. We had a great time. Next week, we continue the story, the incredible story of Exodus and show how it merges in powerful ways with the story of Jesus, the story of Easter. We'll see you then. Easter is a radical story of rescue, more meaningful today than ever. The past year has felt like a storm in the desert. It tried to break you. Isolation, loss, fear, a future out of your control. Sometimes it felt like you would not survive. 
but one man weathered the storm. One man suffered its wrath for you and beat death. Easter is the promise of that power now living in you. The power to survive the storm, the power to be unbreakable.